We are in the middle of a new sermon series entitled, I Am. Everybody say, I Am. I Am. We are studying the seven statements of Christ, and our textbook is the New Testament Gospel of John. The book of John records seven miracles of Jesus. And all of Jesus' miracles are astounding. But the one we are going to review today is no doubt one of the most remarkable and significant. Out of all of the miracles Jesus performed, only two are recorded in all four Gospels. His resurrection, and the second miracle is the feeding of 5,000 people. Out of all the miracles Jesus performed, only two are recorded in all four. The resurrection and the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus took what seemed insignificant, a boy's lunchbox, and multiplied it to feed more than 5,000 people. Everybody say miracle. Miracle. The word miracle, then write this down in the back of your program. The word miracle is defined as something extraordinary. When God intervenes, a supernatural act. A miracle is defined as an incident in which God intervenes with an extraordinary supernatural act. Doesn't make sense. Unexplainable. Miracle. The miracles of Jesus served as parables or object lessons. They were teaching devices or signals or signs. Write that down. Signs or wonders. But this word sign, and write this down. A sign is something that points beyond itself to something greater. A sign is something that points beyond itself to something greater. A sign is something that points beyond itself to something greater. So Jesus performed miracles. They were signs. The purpose for miracles and wonders and, and, and all the things that he did in the demonstration of supernatural power the purpose for miracles and wonders and displays of supernatural power and provision was to be a sign. And I want you to listen to this, it's very important. Don't get so caught up in the sign that you miss who it is pointing to. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Don't get so caught up in the sign that you miss who, capital W-H-O, it is pointing to. The giver is greater than the gift. The blesser is greater than the blessing. The Lord is greater than the Son. Don't get so caught up in the sign that you miss who it is pointing to. Don't worship the sign that says rest stop in 20 miles. Drive the 20 miles and get to the rest stop. Somebody got it. Other, others will get it when you go home. A sign is something that points beyond itself to something greater. But you know, it's not enough for people to believe in Jesus' works and his miracles. Wow, that's incredible. Did you see that? It's not enough for people to believe in Jesus' works. They have to believe in him. They have to believe in the Father who sent him. The miracle of multiplying fishes and loaves was intentionally performed to arrest people's attention. 
It was purposely designed to arrest people's attention to illustrate spiritual truths about Jesus. Jesus did this miracle not only to meet human needs. The people were attending a long church service, a long conference. And Jesus had compassion on them. That's what the Gospel of Mark tells us. He had compassion on them. Jesus did this miracle not only to meet human physical need, but he also did it that he might deliver a sermon about bread and life. Scribble that down on the back of your program. Bread and life. And I want to encourage you all to go home and read John chapter 6 in its entirety. And you're going to see those two words repeated throughout that chapter. Bread and life. It's not in my notes. It's in my marble notebook, but I'll say it here. The type of bread that you eat will determine the type of life that you live. Amen. I said the type of bread that you eat will determine the type of life you live. The type of bread that you eat. I'm not talking about wonder bread or wheat bread or Italian bread or corn bread or corn bread or corn bread. She made corn bread. I just haven't had a chance to eat that. Bread and life. I'm going to say a point and this is very important and I think you should jot this down. What the world needs is Jesus. For he alone is the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. If we use our imagination, we can visualize Jesus teaching on some hillside. Far from some populated town zone. There's a huge crowd following him and they're listening for hours and there's a crowd of people there. In order for us to extract principles from the Bible, it's important for us to put ourselves in the people's shoes and see how the characters and the personalities are like us. When we look at the crowd, we got to confess that we are like the people in the crowd. Crowds are crowds, people are people. The people in the crowd, they fed on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in Israel 2,000 years ago. This is an actual historic event that happened. It's not make-believe, it's not some fairy tale. These are actual people. And these people were hungry. Hunger is something God has built into the human body to remind us to eat. Because without food and water, we will die. Hunger is something that God has built into the human body. Why? To remind us to eat. Because without food and water, we will die. But there is a deeper spiritual hunger in the human heart that will never be satisfied with anything other than God himself. How tragic that most of us ignore God, the only one who can satisfy our deepest hungers. We run around spending time and money and energy on artificial substitutes that doesn't last, that can never give us joy, and never fill us up. <laughs> Some of us are eating religious MSG. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verse 2, when I throw a reference out, you write it down, go home, cross-reference it. Bible-believing, Bible-studying, Bible-reading church. 
Don't take things wholesale. You study, show thyself to be approved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isaiah 55, verse 2. Isaiah says, Why spend money on what is not bread? And, you're, and you labor on what does not satisfy. That describes some of us today. In other words, we can buy sleeping pills, but we cannot buy peace. We can buy stuff, but we cannot buy joy. There is a deeper hunger in the human heart that can never be satisfied by anything outside of God. I believe some people are being delivered today. And deliverance doesn't always include shouting. Can I get an amen? amen. This spiritual hunger is only satisfied in God himself. In fact, we cannot get along with ourselves, and we definitely cannot get along with other people until we are in fellowship with our Heavenly Father through our faith in Jesus Christ. We are hungry people. There's nothing wrong with that. We're built that way. Hunger means that you are alive. An appetite means that you have life. Don't be ashamed of being hungry for more. Oh, I'm going somewhere else. That's not on my notes, but... We are hungry people, but too many of us are filling ourselves with junk food and candy Christianity and stuff that neither fills nor satisfies. Hunger is something that God has built in the human body to remind us to eat. There's a deeper spiritual hunger in the heart. Jesus alone satisfies the human heart. I'm repeating things on purpose, not a typo, on purpose so it gets in your hearts and in your bodies. Amen. Jesus took this seemingly insignificant lunch, multiplied it, and it was small. Everybody say small. And I want to make a side note. Never look at the size of your supply or the might of your strength. Always look at the size and superiority and the supremacy and the sovereignty of your God. Never look at the size of your supply or the might of your strength. Always look at the size, the superiority, the supremacy, and the sovereignty of your God. I will say it again. Never look at the size of your supply or the might of your strength. Always look at the size, the superiority, the supremacy, and the sovereignty of your God. Can I get an amen in the house today? Because if we look at the size, if we look at the small that we've got, we will disqualify ourselves from what God wants to give. If we look at the smallness of what we've got, we will disqualify ourselves from what God wants to give. If we trust in man-made tools and rely on fleshly arms and build our confidence on the quicksand of logic and reason and human understanding, we will miss the move of God. Amen. We will overlook the miracle that is in our supply cabinet. And we'll pass over the increase that is within our own baskets. The blessing is not in the size of your basket. The blessing is based on the size of your God. Amen. I said the blessing is not in the size of your basket. The blessing is based on the size of your God. And my God is awesome in power. My God is unlimited in wonder. My God is supreme and sovereign. My God is Hallelujah. 
And so hear the word of the Lord today. Give God what you've got. Give God what you and other people consider small. Give it to Him. Give God your weaknesses and your strengths. Give God your prayers and your obedience. Oh, that's another sermon. Give God heart and soul. Give God your trust and your life. Because God specializes in using small to make a big impact. One can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. Gideon's army defeated thousands of enemy soldiers. A hundred and twenty those, twenty Holy Ghost people started the church. God says, do not despise small beginnings. Tell your neighbor, you ain't seen nothing yet. Tell your neighbor who's on Facebook, you ain't seen nothing yet. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God is about to do. Another side note, I'm trying to go back to the main text here, but one more side note here. If you turn your nose up to the two fishes and the five loaves, you will not have a seat at the banquet meal. I said if you turn your nose up to the two fishes and the five loaves, you will not have a seat at the banquet meal. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So be open to the small things that God wants to use in your life. Jesus fed over 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. And the following day, many of those people who ate that bread and that fish, they said, you know what, we got to go back to that buffet. <laughs> and they tracked him down and they found Jesus and they said, Jesus, where were you? Rabbi, where were you? And Jesus said in John chapter 6, 26, you ain't looking for me because you want more of me. You're looking for me because you saw a sign. You want to see another magic trick. You're looking for me because you're looking for another free meal. You got to watch out for people who only want to come over. Now, let me not go over that. Let me not go over that. It's another. Only want to ride. Only want to come when you give them money. Only want to. All right, it's another sermon. The crowd had sought Jesus simply because it was feeding time again. Like so many of us today, we think more about our stomachs than we do our souls. We care more about our image than the condition of our hearts. We're obsessed over our social status rather than our eternal destination. The crowd tracked Jesus down because they were hungry again. And how many of us only come to God, only come to church, only pray when we want to get something from God? This crowd thought only of their physical satisfaction, and Jesus refocused their attention onto the spiritual and the satisfaction of their souls. And he wanted them to concentrate on the spiritual truth that he was trying to teach. And he says in verse 27, Do not work for food that expires. And it goes back. But work for food that lasts for eternal life. Well, who's going to provide that? The Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal of approval, it's, it's good. It ain't going to expire. It ain't, ain't, ain't no E. coli in this. This is good stuff. Verse 28, the response of the people. It's typical. It's classic of all of us. Well, what can I do? 
It's kind of reminiscent of the woman at the well. How can I get this water so I don't have to be coming back to this, to this well? Write this down. We sometimes think in terms of what we should do instead of what we ought to be and ought to be open to receive. We oftentimes think in terms of what we should do instead of what we ought to be and ought to be open to receive. Religion is about doing. Relationship is about being. And like many people today, the crowd thought that salvation was the result of their good works. What must we do to work this thing out and to get what you're, you're offering? They didn't understand that it's not about doing, it's about believing. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 tells us that, it, that grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. So we can't boast and say, look at me, I've been in church all these years. I don't do that kind of sin, I don't do that. No, 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 no. Salvation is not based on what we do, it's totally based on what he has done. And Jesus answered in verse 29, this is the work of God, play on the words there, that you believe in the one he has sent. The crowd didn't deserve the food, but out of compassion, Jesus fed the crowd. Life itself is a gift from God, and, and so are the means to sustain that life. But most of us, all of us, myself included, we, we take this for granted. And most of us, we prefer the physical over the spiritual. The crowd wanted an earthly kingdom, Republican, Democrat, capitalist, communist, right, left, blue, red. They wanted an earthly kingdom. They wanted immediate relief from their trouble at no cost to them. They wanted Jesus to be king, to throw off the yoke of the Roman Empire. And too many of us, we struggle with our selfish religious attitude towards Jesus where we want him to meet our spiritual wishes, but we don't want him to deal with our transgressions. We don't want him to point out our, our, our flaws, and we don't want him to call out our sins, and we don't want him to change our lives. Jesus, bless me, but don't touch my mess. Deal with this, this supervisor, but don't talk about my sin. Real quiet here at Richmond. <laughs> and some people like Jesus as a religious leader, but not as Lord. No, no, that Lord stuff, that means that he's in charge. I don't know about all that. I mean, I've come to church, but Lord, that means he's in the driver's seat. That means he has veto power. I don't know about all that. I like his teaching, but Lord, Lord over my money, over my life, over my choices, over my relationships. I don't know about all that. Some people like Jesus in that cute old baby in the nursery, in the manger. Oh, look at him. Silent. Worship team, they're impressed. You see that? We like Jesus as a baby, but we don't want him as Savior. Some people like the fact that Jesus gave up his life. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate that. But when it comes to us living for him, uh, I don't pick up my cross and do what? Turn the other what? Try it. No, nobody here at Richmond is like that. Nobody. That's another church. We must accept Jesus just as he is and not receive him in bits and pieces like some Chinese buffet menu. If 
We don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and Messiah, then we don't receive Him at all. We can't pick and choose. We're talking about bread. That's our theme, our focus. And Jesus uses this metaphor of bread because he's trying to get his message across. And he preaches this sermon in a synagogue. And Jesus calls himself bread from heaven. He calls himself bread of life. I'm not going to give you the answers. You've got to read your Bible in John chapter 6 to see where he says all this. It's an open book quiz. He calls himself bread of life. And he calls himself the living bread. And he was using bread, a familiar material object, to teach a spiritual truth. And here is the point. We receive bread into our bodies and it sustains physical life. By receiving Jesus into our hearts by faith, we are given eternal life. And so when Jesus says, you got to come and eat my flesh, eat your what? Did you? Did you hear what I just said? I'm thinking of a movie, but I don't want to mention the movie because y'all are going to judge your pastor. But anyway, some people got it because you know what I'm talking about. Eat my flesh? What? Obviously, Jesus was speaking metaphorically. Because Jesus was raised in Mosaic law, and Mosaic law was clear. Jews do not eat human flesh or drink human blood. Genesis 9-4, Leviticus 3-17, Jesus knew what the law was. Jesus wouldn't say something to contradict the law. He wasn't talking about physical flesh. No. Cannibalism. Uh-uh. The blood of Jesus. But the crowd took his words literally and missed the whole point of the message. Jesus was speaking metaphorically. In our English language, we, we've got similar expressions, and here they are. We say things like, well, I have to digest what you just said. Right? Or we say, here's food for thought. Right? Or here's something to sink your teeth into. Now, nobody takes these expressions literally. Scripture also uses similar metaphorical language in describing our relationship to God. Psalms 34, verse 8 says, Taste and see <laughs> that the Lord is good. Psalms 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words. To my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's metaphorical language. Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, Jeremiah says, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 2 to 3. And Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, talks about spiritual newborns craving spiritual milk. Jesus is talking metaphorically. The crowds took his words literally and they missed the whole point. Instead of discerning the deeper spiritual meaning, the crowd took it literally and they reacted negatively. 
So the question becomes, how then do we eat his flesh? Write this down. To eat something means to assimilate it, to incorporate it into your body, to make it a part of our physical being. To assimilate it, to incorporate it, to make it a part of our physical being. And so Jesus is simply saying that just as we eat food, and it becomes a part of us to sustain physical life. So we must, by faith, receive him into our hearts and experience spiritual life. And abundant life. And eternal life. We're talking about bread. And we've already established that hunger is something that God has built into the human body. As a reminder, to eat. Don't eat, you're going to die. But beyond the physical, there's a deeper hunger in the human heart. And we here at Richmond believe that Jesus alone satisfies the human heart. Because he alone is the bread of life. The crowd missed this and they immediately dusted off their history textbooks and they said, wait a minute, my mom and my papa taught us that our ancestors received bread from heaven called manna. And they begin to size up Jesus and try to compare him to the miracle of the manna dropping in Moses' day. Now let's be clear about something. There's nothing wrong with comparing and contrasting Christ's miracle with Old Testament occurrences. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, many things in the Old Testament, write this down, are foreshadowings. Go and Bible study on y'all. Many of the things in the Old Testament are foreshadowings or symbols or representative types of Christ and his work. So there's nothing wrong with comparing and contrasting Christ's miracle with an Old Testament occurrence. A matter of fact, Jesus himself often pointed to the Old Testament to say that that over there was symbolic of me over here. Christ said in another verse, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Can I get an amen in this Bible-believing church today? But the crowd is not doing a side-by-side -side theological analysis, no. They're not doing some side-by-side -side theological analysis to prove that Christ was the Messiah. No, no, no. They, they, they held onto a religious belief that the Messiah would come and drop bread from heaven just like Moses. The Jewish religion held and revered the manna as a supreme work of Moses. Therefore, the Messiah was going to surpass Moses. And the people expected the Messiah to be an upgrade version of Moses. And Moses, not only is Jesus greater than Moses, Jesus said, you know, your ancestors, they ate that bread and they died. Manna was temporary, but Christ gives bread that is eternal. There's no comparison. The Old Testament manna was for physical life. Jesus, the bread of life, is for eternal life. Old Testament manna, one nation, Israel. Jesus, the bread of heaven, is for the whole world. Old Testament manna was, was God's sent gift. Jesus, the bread of life, is God's ultimate gift. We're talking about bread. And some of y'all are probably real hungry at this point. All this talk about bread and corn bread. Hunger is something that God's built into the human body to remind us to eat. And our spiritual hunger and our heart can only be satisfied in Christ. And so the question for all of us today, myself included, and please jot this down and meditate on this question because you really just can't. Need your answer it today. What 
are you looking to this day to fill your heart and soul? What are you looking today to fill your heart and soul? When you got the munchies, where do you go to eat? When you have those cravings, where are you going to satisfy? We fill our bellies with food because we know the feeling and the sound of physical hunger. But Richmond, my friends, are we aware of our soul hunger? Do we know the feeling and the sound of spiritual hunger for spiritual bread? Jesus alone satisfies the human heart. So Jesus preaches all this and the people are like, you know what, this is a hard teaching. It's in the Bible. Hard teaching, not for us. Peace out, Jesus. We're leaving. Some of his disciples leave too. We live in a world filled with hungry people who are searching for wholeness and completeness and fulfillment. The people were hungry and Jesus called over, you know, Brother Philip and said, Hey, Philip, they're hungry. Go feed them. It is the responsibility of the church to give food. Amen. Only some people got it. I'm going to say it again. It is the responsibility of the church to give food. We can't blame people and lock people out because they forgot their milk money. We can't turn people away because they forgot to bring a brown lunch bag. It is a responsibility. You'll fill up. They're hungry. You feed them. That's another sermon. So when you partner with Richmond, I'm going to make it real practical. When you partner with Richmond and you bring your gifts to the house of God, we as a church, as a body, are enabled to provide food. What you, what you mean, preacher? Well, Malachi 3.10. It says, bring the tithe so there will be food in my house. So what kind of food are you talking about? Here are the four types of food that Richmond is called to provide. Communion bread. I'm not trying to be cute. This is biblical. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What kind of bread we're responsible for? Communion bread. Jesus said, eat this to remember me. So that's number one, communion bread. The next kind of bread or food we're responsible for is cookies for the nursery. I'm serious, apple crackers. You can get them at Costco. Jesus said, bring the little children to me. Y'all got kids and grandkids and nieces and Nephews, you need cookies. <laughs> Jesus said to Peter, you love me? Feed my lambs. Amen. That's why we started a nursery called Little Lambs. Number three, here's the third type of bread that we're called to provide here at Richmond. Physical bread for the needy. Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. That's what we're called to do, and I can't wait for us to be feeding some hungry people. Amen. Whether they're in this house or outside on the street, can I get an amen in the house? Amen. Amen. And the most important food that we're called to provide is spiritual food. Amen. From this pulpit every Sunday, Jesus said, man does not live. <laughs> Man does not live on cornbread or wonder bread or Italian bread alone, but on every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Amen. Matthew 4.4. 4. And Jesus quoted that while the devil tempted him to turn rocks into bread. Physical bread only sustains physical life, but spiritual bread sustains spiritual life. And Jesus is the bread of life. 
the old song says it best, and I don't know if the worship team can sing it or not. I didn't prep them or cue them, but I'm not going to sing it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it. I don't know if I should do it. Quit while you're ahead. It says, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. I challenge some people to hum that on the way home. And I ain't going to sing it. <laughs> Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of life sustains us. Here's the practical application, and we're wrapping up. The way to sustain ourselves spiritually is to feed on the Word of God. And I'm going to be very practical here. So write this down. I hope you still have space in the back of your program. Everyone here at Richmond ought to own and use a baby Bible. Go on Amazon.com or CBD or go to the resource table. Everybody here at Richmond ought to own a daily Bible or a devotional Bible. Well, what's wrong with the Bible that I got? Well, nothing but a daily Bible will break up and organize the Bible into small sections so you can eat it a little bit at a time every day. Can I get an amen? Amen. I expect everybody to get a daily Bible and a devotional Bible. I expect everybody here to own and use some sort of devotional booklet. You can go to the resource table and get our daily bread. We don't sell it. Just whatever you got to give and to sow, give it so we can recycle it. If you don't want our daily bread, get something else. Everybody should have some sort of devotional booklet. I use Beth Moore. I use Jesus Calling. I use Max Ricardo. Use whatever you feel led to use. I expect everybody here at Richmond who sends and receives email, because everybody doesn't do email, but if you send and receive email, I expect you to sign up for an e-devotional. Joe Holstein, Joseph Prince, Joyce Myers, Charles Stanley is my personal favorite, T.D. Jakes, Tony Evans. I'm just saying my personal favorite. I'm not telling you you should do that. Max Cato, Rick Warren is another personal favorite. You get and send emails, you should get an email in your inbox. And I expect everybody here to listen and watch Bible-based preachers and teachers throughout the week because Sunday ain't enough. You don't eat once a day or even one time a day. And I say this in love. These are not hints or suggestions. These are pastoral instructions. Can I get an amen? amen. The way we sustain ourselves spiritually is to feed on the Word because our souls will starve apart from the word of life as just in place and softly. I'm going to share a story of something that happened in the third world Asian country. There was a famine and a missionary was visiting around the villages and he met a boy who was nothing but skin and bones. The missionary told the boy to go at once to the mission compound and ask for food. And the boy pleaded that he would not be admitted to the compound unless he had some authorization. So the missionary took a slip of paper and wrote a note on it and said, here you go, here's your authorization. Several days later, the poor boy was found lying dead with a piece of paper folded and tied around his neck. He had never acted upon the promise. He had never submitted the piece of paper to get what he was authorized to receive. How many people are dying around us today because they will not act upon God's promises and come and believe and take the bread of life that is in Christ Jesus. How many days, weeks, God forbid, have we gone without eating? 
What substitutes have we used to fill our hearts and our minds? Are we spending time every day reading the Word of God? My last point, if you don't remember anything else, Jesus is the bread of life. Let's stand together in Jesus' name.